Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining tonight. I'm Alexandra Blaney, the Director of Production at Shine Global. And today, which is World Day Against Child Labor, we're excited to have you joining us for a conversation about child labor in the United States, sparked by our film, The Harvest La Cosecha. For those of you here tonight who are not familiar with Shine Global, we're a nonprofit media production company that gives voice to children and families by sharing their stories of resilience to raise awareness, promote action, and inspire change. All of our films are funded by the generous donations of viewers like you. It's our 15th anniversary year and the Harvest La Cosecha is the third in a series of screenings we've been doing in celebration. So I hope you'll enjoy this event and join us for future ones throughout the year. Before we get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how this system works. For many of you, it might be your first virtual screening, given our new world. Um, so the chat box is where you can ask all your questions and we'll pass those on to the panelists. So please go ahead and say hello right now and tell us where you're tuning in from. We, we wanna hear from you. If you get an error while you're doing the stream, have connection issues, we suggest that you refresh the page and then re-enter the live stream, and hopefully that will fix your problem. If you really just can't get connected or there's too much buffering, the session is being recorded. So if you can't rejoin the stream for any reason, you'll still have a chance to watch the recorded session later. Uh, it will stay up through this Sunday, so you'll be able to watch the whole thing uh, over the next few days. And a reminder that all donations tonight are being shared with the Farm Workers COVID-19 Pandemic Relief Fund, which will help keep farm worker families safe as they perform the essential work to feed all of us. And we're providing a link in the chat box for you as well. So tonight we're bringing you The Harvest La Cosecha, which was our second documentary film that was originally released in 2011 and was directed by U Roberto Romano. It follows the lives of three migrant farm worker children, Zulema, Perla, and Victor, and their families as they travel across the country working in the fields. An estimated 400,000 children in the US work in agriculture, one of the most dangerous occupations, and this is legal in the United States today. The Fair Labor Standards Act excludes agriculture from the protections children and workers and in other industries receive setting up a separate and unequal system. So now I'd like to bring up our panelists to discuss these issues. And uh, while they're coming up, I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction about them. Uh, Zulema Lopez was 12 years old when she was in the film. She's now a graduate of Michigan State University with a degree in human capital and society and has used her platform to advocate for child labor laws, including speaking at the UN's International Labor Conference in Geneva. She's been an inspiration to many young people in the US as she's traveled around speaking at colleges and high schools. Norma Flores Lopez is the Chief Programs Officer at Justice for Migrant Women. She began working in the fields at the age of 12 and has become an, ag an advocate for migrant farm worker children. She currently serves on the Board of Directors for the National Consumers League. She's the Chair of the Child Labor Coalition's Domestic Issues Committee and she's the representative for the United States on the board of directors for the Global March Against Child Labor. And Congresswoman Lucille Roybal Allard from California became the first Mexican-American woman elected to Congress in 1992. And last year, she became the first Latina to serve as one of the 12 cardinals or chairs of, a response of, of the House Appropriations Committee. Uh, Congresswoman Roybal Allard is the author of the Children's Act for Responsible Employment and Farm Safety called the CARE Act for short, and you'll hear more about that tonight, which would change child labor practices in agriculture. She's also an original co-author of the DREAM Act, which would allow certain US-raised immigrant youth to earn lawful permanent residence and eventual American citizenship. And lastly, our moderator, Susan McLaurie. She's the co-founder and executive director of Shine Global, and she executive produced The Harvest La Cosecha, along with the Oscar-winning Innocente, uh, the Emmy-winning and Oscar-nominated War Dance, One Way Up in 3D, The Eagle Huntress and Liana, and she produced The Wrong Way and Virtually Free, as well as leading the educational outreach and social advocacy efforts for all of Shine Global's films. So I'll let them all take it from here. 
Thanks, Alex. It's my great pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you all this evening, and I want to thank you so much for taking your time to join us. Um, our thanks also to all of you who are listening in. We hope that you enjoyed watching The Harvest. Um, I would like to take a moment to, uh, to, to talk about our director, Robin Romano. Um, Robin was a tireless activist on behalf of child workers, both here in the States and globally. Before directing The Harvest, he directed a film called Stolen Childhoods about children enslaved in, in carpet making industry in Asia and The Dark Side of Chocolate about African children who were forced uh, to, at uh, truly substandard wages to pick uh, cocoa beans for the, for the chocolate industry. Um, he tragically died back in 2013. Um, and uh, I just want to take a moment to, to remember him as a friend, an artist, and an activist. I'd also like to thank some of the people who are here listening tonight, including our co-producer, Charlie Sadoff, our editor, Nick Clark, and Roger Rosenthal from the Migrant Legal Action Project, who was an important consultant to us. So, so thank you all for joining. Uh, so what we're going to do is, uh, well, let me back up one second and just say, against the very personal stories of Zulema, Perla, Victor, and their families, uh, we, what we're gonna do tonight is to take a look at the current um, challenges facing migrant farm workers and the efforts that are being made to redress them. So uh, the way this will work is I have five or six questions that I would like to direct to the three of you, uh, and then we're gonna open it up to questions from our listeners. So my first question is how you, uh, how each of you first became aware of the issue of migrant farm work um, and, and what compelled you to assume the roles you went on to, to assume. I know in two of your cases, you had very, very intensive firsthand experience. So Norma, let me start with you. You were a child migrant farm worker for many years. Um, Tell us a little bit about that and, and how that, that experience really propelled you into the very active activism that you do. Thank you for the question, Susan. And really, it's an honor to be able to be here with you guys and be a part of this very important panel on World Day Against Child Labor. So I grew up, as you mentioned, working in a migrant farm worker family. And so I know firsthand how hard and cruel it can really be to be working in the fields at a very young age. I started working in the fields at around the age of nine years old. And every summer after that, uh, I was working 12 hour days, seven days a week, just to be able to help my family put food on the table. Um, in reality, it, was, it could be pretty traumatic, some of the moments that, that in the experiences I had growing up in the fields. Um, I saw how our rights and dignity uh, were robbed every single day. Um, I saw a disregard often from crew leaders about our health and well-being. And I saw also generations of farm workers that were trapped in the cycle of poverty, that no matter how hard they worked, that they were just not able to get ahead. And so these were folks that were my family, they were my neighbors, they were my friends. And so I came to the realization that not a whole lot had changed in the fields since my parents grew up working in the fields or their parents. The stories of hard work and desperate poverty were the same as my parents, um, the same as their parents, and the same as about the half million children that continue to work in the fields here in the U.S. today. And so all of these are lives that are tainted with degradation, with pain, and with sacrifice through an entrenched institution of racism. And so I decided that I needed to be part of the change I wanted to see in the world. And so because of that, that was my motivation to be able to dedicate my life to being able to raise awareness on this issue, to be able to build power in my community and to demand some real solutions to be able to end um, this exploitation of children. Thank you, Norma. Uh, Zulema, you were one of the three subjects of the harvest um, and you, you brought to life so poignantly the conflict that you felt between uh, being forced to do work that was just backbreaking and you hated it, but doing it because you, you understood the obligation to your parent. Absolutely. And um, I can relate a lot to Norma, just like I can relate to so many uh, thousands, thousands of um, children around the U.S. 
and even around the world in regards to how, how young we were working, how many hours under the, con um, the conditions we were in. Um, all that to say though, my, my perspective was a little bit different from Norma's just because I was unaware that my lifestyle was, um, was not what it was supposed to be. Um, I have, I'm a third generation farm work, uh, migrant farm worker as a, uh, since I was a child, so I was seven. Um, is what my mom says, but all I remember is is growing up in the fields. Um, I have pictures of um, me and my siblings literally in boxes of cucumbers just hanging out because my mom had to work and we were just, she, she couldn't afford a babysitter or whatnot. So to me, that lifestyle was very, was very normal is what I would say. So when I was introduced to the documentary, The Harvest and, and potentially being a subject in it, um, I really was kind of flabbergasted by how many people really just wanted to view my life. I didn't know it was that much different from the next person next to me, the person next to me, I mean. So um, once that happened, um, I definitely came into a realization that I wasn't in, in a, by any means in a normal lifestyle that, that a, a child um, should have. So um, that's where I started to finally realize um, was with the documentary and that really eyes in. I educated myself in a sense, uh, viewing it and um, getting, uh, gaining information from everybody who worked on it and doing my own, um, um, sorry, I started basically looking up things and realizing again that there was a problem and from there on it, I just, I just blew up and started, you know, being a part of the change. So, yeah. I didn't realize I had muted myself. Um, <laughs> I think my family wishes they had a mute button at home for me, but uh, uh, Congresswoman, you first introduced the CARE Act back in 2001. Uh, can you can you tell us about what this act is? I I know it, the name of it is the, the Children's Act for Responsible Employment and Farm Safety. Um, can you help us to understand it a little bit better? And what compelled you to author it? Okay. Well, the the plight of of, of children working in agriculture and, and their families was actually brought to my attention by an, uh, an advocacy organization uh, known as uh, AFOP. It's the um, American, I'm trying to remember, the, the, uh, the American, uh, no, the Association of Farm Worker Opportunity Programs. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, when they brought this to my attention, I was shocked. I think like the majority of, of Americans had no idea of, of the, the plight of migrant uh, ag children or, or their families. So I worked with that organization to introduce a bill uh, back in 20 or 2001. And I thought it would be a no brainer because I thought it would just be easy to educate members of Congress and the uh, public in general that children working in agriculture were not protected under the, the same uh, child protection laws as every other child in every other industry. And unfortunately, uh, that was not true. And so we are, here we are 19 years later. And I, again, I've been re uh, uh, reintroducing this bill ever since 2001. And what the bill does, uh, just put in, in simple terms, it raises the the labor standards and protections for farm worker children to the same level that is set for children in all other occupations. Mm -hmm. and, and just quickly, um, I'll just go through some of the points very, very quickly. Uh, children ages 12 to 13 would be prohibited from working outside of the school hours. And also children ages between 14 and 15 uh, they can work outside of school hours, but they cannot work before 7 a.m. or after 7 p.m. or more than three hours on a, on a school day or more than 18 hours uh, in a school week. And why is that important? That is important because studies have shown that 
uh, ag children, children that work in ag agriculture, drop out of school four times of the national average. So that is intended to address that so that they can be in school, they can study, and they can have an opportunity to, to advance uh, and, and break that cycle of, of not being uh, family after family, child after child, not being able to, to uh, seek a better life. Mm -hmm. It also prohibits children from working uh, hazardous jobs until the age of 18. A report by the government um, office, GAO, found that more than half of work-related fatalities, more than half of the fatalities uh, related to, uh, to work were in, with children of agriculture. So mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons that this, um, this bill uh, establish, uh, does, prevents children under the age of 18 for working uh, with hazardous material. The bill also provides children with get greater protections against pesticide exposure by raising the labor protection standards. And for anyone that saw the, the film, there was the, the young man who was working in the fields and it showed, showed that he, he said his skin was falling off yeah. because what he was working with was hazardous. That would not be able to happen under my bill. And the bill also includes reporting requirements on job-related injuries and serious illnesses and it also uh, establishes penalties for ch child labor violations and increases the, the penalties um, uh, uh, for those violations so that uh, those who own these uh, farms uh, will have to pay a penalty if they violate these child mm -hmm. labor laws. Okay. So that, that's just a, a summary of the bill, but it is not any different than the laws that protect every other child in every other industry. Right. And it's just been amazing to me that 19 years later, we still haven't been able to protect children working in agriculture. It's really unfathomable, I, I, I must say. I do remember in uh, September of 2010, uh, I was excited to uh, go to Capitol Hill, meet you for the first time. And um, that year, you brought the harvest to uh, the attention of members of Congress with the, with the help of executive producer Eva Longoria and director Robin Romano. And I'm curious, what, what prompted you to, to make that decision to show the film as, as part of your, your um, efforts that year? Well, well my hope was that since I was unaware of it, I also found out that many of my colleagues in Congress were also unaware of the plight of, of children in agriculture and, and their families. And I was hoping that by bringing attention to it, that I would be able to get the support that I needed in order uh, to pass the bill. But unfortunately, the uh, Farm Worker Bureau and the industry itself is so powerful that they would not support the bill. They actually actively lobbied against it. And I was not able to get the support that I needed to, to even get a hearing for the bill. And so that, that was extremely uh, disappointing. And I, one of the concerns that they would raise was, well, this would hurt family farms. We have exemptions for family farms. Family farms are not impacted uh, by, by this bill. Right. And so every objection that they had, we worked with uh, our ledge counsel, with our attorneys, we worked with advocates to find the language to address the concerns that were raised. And it did not uh, change the Farm Worker Bureau's position or the position of, of those who own these uh, agriculture, which are really corporations, they're not, they're not family owned businesses. Yeah, regrettably. Norma, where does this leave us today? Can, can, you, can you talk a bit about uh, the, the, the current status of um, migrant farm families? Um, do they need additional legal protections? And if so, 
what? So as I had mentioned, not much has changed for farm workers since my parents grew up in the fields and their parents were in the fields. Um, you know, they still are uh, living in desperate poverty. They're still facing food insecurity. Um, they're still dealing with a lot of issues. Um, and all of that looks, if you look at it, it has a lot to do with the lack of basic rights and protections um, under US law. Farmers continue to be denied those basic rights. Farm workers still don't have the right to overtime pay or collective bargaining. And without these rights, they can be retaliated against for organizing or complaining about their work conditions asking for a raise. Um, the, many of farm workers are afraid to speak up because they'll get blacklisted and, and they really need these wages to be able to feed their families. Um, and these same labor laws, as uh, the Congresswoman mentioned, allow for young children of farm workers to be uh, put to work uh, long hours with very few protections um, and perform hazardous work, things that you do not hear of in any other industry. And so without these changes in the law, you're going to see farm workers that are continue to be exploited and live in desperate poverty. And this is here in America in our backyards. And so we need to make sure that the same protections that all other workers have in this country are also provided to farm workers. Um, and along with that, that they're also provided with a fair living wage. They should be able to feed their families after working very long days to feed hours. And now with the coronavirus epidemic, what it has shown is that we rely literally on the fruits and labor of these essential workers. And these essential workers should also not be the most disenfranchised. Farm workers are the backbone of our country. And the least that they deserve, as I mentioned, is the same basic protections that all other workers are provided. And we must also acknowledge that the majority of farm workers, which we depend on, belong to mixed status families or are undocumented themselves although their families, their children, are vastly majority of them U.S. citizens. And so they should be provided with some pathway to citizenship, some way to be able to get legal status so that they can be able to keep their families together. And so what we've seen again through this pandemic has been that these families have been put much higher risk um, the health exposure, um, the, the risk to being able to find resources. And these are impacts that are really going to be felt uh, for a long time. And so uh, farm workers really do depend on us to be able to speak out and to make sure that we give them those same rights, that we demand that they have the same rights and protections that all other workers in America enjoy today. Thank you. I remember one of the scenes, um, I was watching the film again last night, and I'd forgotten the scene, but the scene in which um, Victor's mother talks about the days they would go to in, through the supermarket and some weeks they might be able to afford to buy some of the produce that they themselves had picked and other, other weeks they could not. And you just think, this is just so wrong. So it's just, and, uh, thank you for the, all the work that you're doing on their behalf. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, we know that in March of this year, Congress ironically did pass the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Bill, um, and designed to uh, provide assistance to families who are suffering uh, from, from the pandemic. Um, do you think that, uh, were there provisions in this bill for, for migrant farm workers, particularly uh, I mean, ironically, they've been, they've been designated as essential workers, and yet, to Norma's point, many of them uh, are, are, are still struggling horribly, um, and, and for a percentage of them, their lack of documentation is, is a factor in that. Um, it, it, does, it meet the, does, does this bill meet the needs of, of migrant farm workers adequately? And if not, what, what concerns do you have? No, the, the, the CARES Act uh, failed in uh, protecting uh, children and families uh, in agriculture, unfortunately. Uh, that, that was one of the weaknesses uh, of the bill. Even though they were considered essential workers, they had to work, and yet we were not able to uh, get any protections for them under the CARES Act. The, the good news is that the HEROES Act, which passed the House, tries to correct 
that uh, deficiency. And let me just uh, highlight some of the things that farm workers would be able to, uh, uh, the help that they would be able to receive under the, the HEROES bill. The, it ensures access to COVID-19 testing and treatment for undocumented individuals. It extends direct cash payments to uh, taxpaying immigrants that with individual taxpayer identification numbers. It also establishes uh, a fund for uh, essential workers to ensure that essential workers who risk their lives working during a pandemic can receive hazardous pay. Okay. It also mandates that employers, um, uh, the, uh, that employers provide uh, their employees with emergency paid leave if they become sick with uh, COVID-19. Uh, and this also, again, this also includes farm workers. Uh, it requires the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to create new workplace guidance to ensure that employers are protecting their workers' safety and protects workers with retaliation for raising safety concerns. For example, with COVID-19, there were those working in the fields who didn't have any masks, didn't have any kind of protections, and if they wanted it, they were going to have to pay for it uh, themselves. And of course, you know, some of them couldn't even, didn't even have the money to buy the food that they needed yeah. uh, to pay for their families. So this would require the employer to provide that uh, protection. It also, uh, the HEROES Act would also extend uh, the pandemic EBT program through the summer and until the schools reopen to ensure that the families uh, with children who receive free and reduced uh, price meals can continue to access um, to uh, health uh, meals during school closures due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So that bill right now, um, was designed to fill the gaps that were lacking in the CARES Act. It passed the House, and unfortunately, right now, it is in the Senate, and the Senate is not moving on the bill right now. So um, the, the leadership of the House is continuing to push to uh, get that bill finalized. And we are working very hard to make sure that the protections that we have in the bill for our farm worker children and families uh, remain in that bill and that it will ultimately be signed uh, by the president. Thank you. That, that, that must be so frustrating to, to see it stalled there and, and knowing that knowing the, the help it would bring and certainly hope that it passes the Senate. With it is. It's extremely... Uh, uh, frustrating and it's very hard to understand given yeah. the fact that that children and families uh, are suffering right now yeah. because we haven't passed that bill. Yeah. Um, Norma, uh, beyond that the health risks posed to farm workers by COVID-19, um, you have other concerns about the impact of this virus on, on the plight of farm workers. Could you share some of that with us? Yes, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a truly a detrimental impact on some of the most marginalized communities around the world, including here in the U.S. So those that are living in poverty or at, at risk, it's really making their lives much more challenging. And so farm workers, especially their children, are among the most vulnerable communities and are feeling uh, the brunt of this. Um, a World Bank model predicts that 40 to 60 million people are going to be forced into extreme poverty because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this rise in global poverty is going to force millions of children into child labor. And we're very concerned about that because it was the same poverty that pushed my parents to take me out to the fields to help them make ends meet, even though they were working really long hours. And now as farm workers, as some of them have had to leave uh, the fields, particularly the mothers are the ones that are feeling the brunt of this, that are having to leave their jobs 
wages that they're losing to be able to care for their children as the schools have closed, as Head Start centers have closed, as childcare providers have been closing their doors, the mothers have been going home to be able to provide this care and don't know how they're gonna be able to pay rent, how they're gonna be able to buy groceries or afford any of these things. As mentioned, many of them did not qualify for some of these stimulus aid packages that pass because of their mixed status um, in their families. Uh, and, and so these are children, again, oftentimes US citizens that were denied help because of the status of their parents. And so in the last two decades, uh, we've seen the number of children trapped in child labor has dropped by nearly 100 million. However, we're still at 152 million. And with this pandemic, it really threatens to be able to erase all of that progress that we're, we've made so far. And so as these outbreaks outbreaks continue to make their way across rural communities. Families living in poverty, farm worker families, um, don't have those resources that they need to be able to get access to healthcare, the limited amount of clinics, even those clinics are having a hard time finding a PPE um, and the farm workers themselves having the, the face mask to be able to protect themselves. Um, Food and supplies are uh, something that they're struggling to be able to find. In Florida, we were having reports of, you know, lines of 500 farm workers um, at a food bank and 300 of them being turned away without any food. Um, oh. The, so really the need is huge and meanwhile the headlines are showing of how growers are having to let their um, harvest rot in the fields or having to dump milk and other foods and yet there was this huge need for farm workers. And so we're seeing work patterns and school instruction that is being disrupted, millions of lives that are being lost. And so we know that recovery is going to be difficult, if not impossible, for farm workers. And so today, being World Day Against Child Labor, we recognize that this crisis is being extended out to children who have suffered the anxiety, hunger, and fear that has taken a hold of our communities. But we also know that these devastating consequences of the pandemic are going to have long-lasting effects on, on these children's lives. Oh, that's really, that's so heartbreaking to, uh, to contemplate. Uh, Zulema, when we, uh, when we first met you, you were 12 years old, you were entering the eighth grade. Um, you know, you took us back into that, that time of adolescence really so, so poignantly. Um, I know from, from the stories that you and, and, uh, Perla and Victor all shared and, and you, you really were modeling the experiences of literally hundreds of thousands of other kids. Um, you, in, you, in your family's case, you picked three different crops every year. I think it was onions in, in Texas. And I love how you called them the pickles rather than cucumbers. That always made me laugh. Um, and I can't remember, that was, was that in Missouri where you were picking cucumbers? Michigan. Oh, oh okay. So you picked cucumbers and then apples, both in, in Michigan. Right. Um, and uh, I remember being so struck when we were making the film to learn that so many migrant families had to start their migration, maybe April, May, and they didn't get back till October, November. And that put so many thousands of children behind the eight ball. Um, and I, you know, I would, I remember thinking about this a lot, like, well, how do they ever catch up? And I know, you know, at, at, uh, at, at one point you, you really talked about that. I'm, I always feel behind. I don't know that I'll ever catch up. And yet you did. You, you, you got through high school, you graduated high school, you went to college, you graduated last, uh, last December. And along the way, you yourself became an activist. And I know you've spoken at several different convenings. Um, tell, us, tell us about your own, your own trip in this regard. Yeah, so um, again, we're, we're migrant farm workers. So we travel for, for we, we follow the crop is, is what it is. And um, there's changing seasons. So whenever one crop was done, we'd, we'd move on to the next. Um, I remember in particular my freshman year of high school, ninth grade, um, I actually started off um, school in Michigan 
then we went to North Carolina, then we went to Florida, and then we went to Texas. In a matter of 10 months, I had gone to four high schools. Um, little did I learn at the end of the year, um, I was actually gonna be, um, stay, a, stay as a freshman. Um, in order to be as considered a sophomore, I had to attend summer school, which um, gratefully, Veronica Borgoa, a mentor of mine, let me stay um, at her home in order for me to be able to catch up. Um, not many people have that, you know, um, a lot of these kids missed the opportunity and just stayed back behind um, a year. Um, this definitely discourages a lot of students. Um, in in my case, I, I think I even said it in the film, I don't, I didn't think that I was going to even make it to high school, let alone graduate high school. So it, for me, I had a lot of support um, in, in that regard. And um, I was able to make it out of high school. And once I finished high school, I, I thought, wow, what's the next step? College. So um, I was able to encourage myself to apply to Michigan State University and didn't think I was gonna get in, but here I am as a MSU graduate. Along the way, um, even when I was in 10th, uh, 10th grade, 11th grade of high school, I was already speaking at um, high schools around my, my town, around my city. Um, they, they have Spanish classes where they would show the film The Harvest and they would contact um, my high school, Lyndon B. Johnson High School in Laredo and asked me to come and speak. I did that for mo uh, multiple times during, during my high school years. And then it became um, um, even in a, in a larger scale, thanks to Norma. Nor Norma um, she actually invited me to participate in the International Labor of Organizations um, Global March for Child Labor in 2018, with, where I traveled to Geneva, Switzerland, and was able to speak on in my part um, on the on the issues of child labor, not just in the United States but but around the world. So, I mean, it was all. I'm not gonna lie. The the film gave me the drive, gave me the push to to start um, to start rolling the wheels in in my advocacy. But now I definitely find it as um, um, uh, what's it called a uh, a priority. Mm -hmm. um, it's my story. It's not just my story. It's the story of many of ours, and I'm definitely grateful to have the platform to be able to share that with the world. Thank you. Uh, a couple of times uh, during the film, Robin asks you what if, if you have dreams, and at one point you say, uh, "Don't you know?" What you, you said, "I don't really have time for those." And, and another time you say, I'm working on those. Do you have dreams right. today? So I've learned that you, you keep developing dreams. Um, I graduated high school and that was something I didn't know I was gonna do. I graduated college and that was an amazing um, accomplishment, not just for me, but for my family. One of my biggest dreams was to give my, give my siblings the, um, to steer them in the right direction. And I hope that they see me now as, as a role model and to keep going. And now um, I did graduate with a bachelor's degree in human capital and society, big word for human resources. Um, if I don't, if I, I'd like to keep um, advocating for child labor laws, but I'd also, um, for if, and if, if I had to choose another career path, I'd like to be like the human resources director of a large company someday. Good for you, good for you. Um, is that dog in your house? <laughs> I'm a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, wants a snack or something. <laughs> okay. Well, what I'd like to do is open it up to questions from our listeners. Um, so Jill asks this question. Uh, a congresswoman, perhaps you could help us answer this. She asks how the CARE Act. Um, and, and farm worker reform generally fits in with the H2A or H2B programs. H2A and H2B program? Yeah, I have to confess complete ignorance of what those are, so. Uh, well, it, th th those are um, the, the classification of work permits. Um, many of, of, of our, our, our farm workers, uh, come to this country who are undocumented so they 
there's there's a mixture in and a lot of the farm worker families that it's mixed use fam um, mixed families mm -hmm. and so um, some of those permits are for the more high skilled uh, you know the scientists and others and then there there is the um, the permits for for the um, for workers like 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 the ag workers. Mm -hmm. I personally am not as familiar with all the different categories. Okay. Uh, so whoever is asking that question, uh, if they could co contact me and I could get them the exact uh, definition of those two categories and what falls under them. But some are for high skilled workers. Others are for um, for lower skilled. Mm -hmm. Uh, would, would be considered lower skill workers. Okay. And Susan, but, but, but in but in our but in but within as I understand it, and maybe Norma and and Duella actually could help me with this. Uh, based on the information that I have, and some of the difficulties that we've had in passing, uh, n not just our bill, but also uh, passing the um, the Heroes Act, is that a large majority of our ag people. And, and, and those who work in agriculture are undocumented. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be one of the, the most difficult uh, points to overcome in terms of being able to get our bill passed, particularly on the, uh, on the Senate side. And, and that's, I mean, the fact is we're talking about children, we're talking about human beings and every, everyone should be entitled to health care, to a decent wage, to the ability to get an education. Absolutely. But that right now, unfortunately, in this current atmosphere is very difficult to, to get across, particularly uh, on the Senate side, so that we could pass the HEROES bill. So um, whoever asked that question, if they could contact my office and I could give them- uh, We'll make sure they have that information about the, the differences of the of the two of the two uh, bills, not, not the two bills, but the, Thank the, you. the H2A. Norma, were you going to say something? Yes. So what I was going to uh, share was the, the CARE Act um, that Congresswoman Roba Allard has introduced um, is to be able to address the issue of child labor in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and that's separate and aside from guest workers, which are the two classifications that the Congresswoman was talking about. Um, that's the guest worker program. Um, and the H-2A in particular uh, is talking about agricultural workers. Those have been brought into the U.S. to be able to do the agricultural work because growers oftentimes Times claim that there are not enough hands, not enough workers. And what we've been seeing is they have actually been using um, these H-2A workers to displace many of the families that do work on farms. And so we have farm worker families that are struggling to be able to find work, especially those that are undocumented, um, because they've been uh, pushed out by H-2A workers. The H-2A worker program is very attractive to many, uh, many growers because those workers are tied to that grower. There is an incentive for these uh, guest workers to not speak out about work conditions, about wages, about um, living conditions because they are tied to that grower and they will be sent back. And again, these are workers that are pretty desperate and, and living in poverty and are counting on these wages to send back to their families. Um, so without, uh, with, with these part this particular guest worker program, um, they're not able to change to another uh, company if they don't like uh, the work that they're doing. It's a very anti-American, uh, to be honest. And all it's doing is it's, it's displacing many of the families who do have those choices and growers just would rather not deal with it. Um, and, but again, that is a separate program and will not be addressed. It, it's not touched any aspect that has to do with the CARE Act. It's, it's, a, it's a separate issue that does impact farm worker families, um, unfortunately. But with the CARE Act, again, that's to be able to equalize child labor laws, to protect children, to make sure that children are not being exploited, taken advantage of in one of the most dangerous industries, and that they have the same legal protections that any other child has in any other industry. I, I think Norma described the uh to a perfectly yes yeah, so yeah. really helpful what you're describing sounds like as, as labor. I was talking i was i was recalling all the different points yeah that's yeah. exactly right yeah thank you uh let's see um
Bill has asked questions about the organizations that support farm workers and how they are funded. Building off of that for all the panelists, what resources help you in your own experience? Um, and, um, and, and what type of support would you say is the most crucial? So I think Sulema had touched on some of those, making sure we have mentorship, making sure that there's investments in the farm worker community, um, that we have programs that support us. Um, uh, Congresswoman Lucy Roba Allard mentioned the Association of Farm Worker Opportunity Programs, which is an association of programs that offer job training for farm workers. And so early on, um, when I was first getting started, those were the programs that helped me uh, be able to find my voice, to be able to uh, see the potential in me and invest in me, whether it's through training, mentorship, um, guidance, helping me catch up with those class credits that I was missing to be able to graduate high school. The NFJP programs helped me, the migrant education programs helped me throughout my education. Um, programs like Migrant Head Start kept me out of the field. So like Sulem, I didn't have to be sitting, you know, in, in the hot fields while my mom was working. I had a safe place where I could be able to learn, where I could be able to get nutritious meals and be taken care of. So those are all programs, federal programs that help farm workers um, in need and to make sure that the children are taken care of and are able to have an opportunity to get an education. And all of those, even through the camp programs and other programs that invest in farm workers are incredibly important. The same way we also ask for foundations as they're thinking about their giving and the type of programs that they want to be able to build, uh, to be able to, to, to fund, um, to think about those programs that work with the community, that are led by the community, that uh, empower the community. Uh, as you see, the some of the best leaders come from the community. You have Sulema, who's the next generation of activists that comes from there, that has that firsthand experience and understands it. Um, Honestly, the farmer community doesn't need anybody to save them. They have those answers. They just need a fair living wage. They just need a pathway to citizenship to keep their families together. They just need investments in their community and support so that they can be able to achieve great things. And we've seen it, you know, even in today's landscape, you have um, a former farm worker that is a, a doctor and is now serving in Congress or another one that um, went on to become an astronaut and went into space. And you have all these amazing stories of former farm workers that with mentorship and investment, they were able to go on and do incredible things, um, surgeons, lawyers, members of Congress. And, and those are the kind of stories that we want to continue to see, you know, folks like Sulema to go and, and head the HR department of a great company. I think those are all wonderful things and it all starts with investing in the farm worker community. Thank you, Norma. So let me add to that at all. That if, uh, I'm wondering, I actually don't know this, but when, when you went to college, did, did the camp program play a role in, in your college career? Absolutely. So um, the camp program, program def, was definitely um, a freshman program that helped um, incoming students uh, from my background to adjust to the college life. Um, and in, in the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, for me, again, I, I definitely was on the back track of how everybody else got into college. I, I had to, str I was struggling to get all, I mean, know all the material and um, kind of compete next to, these, next to these other students who have been in the same school for 12 years. Um, the camp program was kind of, I'm not gonna, it was a support system for us um, migrant. Uh, students to be able to, to lean on them whenever we had difficulties and they prepared us very well for the next three years but it's definitely like Norma said it's definitely the support definitely the um, federal funded programs that definitely would help us elevate our our you know our progress in, in regards to where we're at right now. Thank you. We have time for one more question and it's going to go to Ryan. It says, how can my high school students get involved in a meaningful way? We show La Cosecha every year. We're always looking for ways to get them involved to make them understand how real this topic is. Um, and so what, what, what can the average American person do to make a difference for farm workers? Um, and just whoever would like to tackle this well, person. Okay, ask I'll, I'll, st I'll start it off. Okay. Let me tell you that whenever there is significant change made in this country and by members of Congress. It is because of the average American 
taking this on as an issue and, and, and encouraging and pushing and advocating for that issue with their elected officials, both at the state and the local level. The power of change really is with the people themselves. And I think it's really important that the American public understands that the power that they have to create positive change. Very often in, in the communities that I represent and, and in poor minority communities, the feeling is, and there's this, I hear this all the time, para que? It's what's the use? Nobody's going to listen to us. And to them, what I say to them, that's exactly what our enemies want our communities yeah, to believe. Counting on that. That we're helpless, that we're powerless. Because as long as we believe that, we won't use the power that we have to create that positive change. And that's what our enemies are afraid of, that we will realize our own power. And I think that the best example that I could use is the, the advocacy and the movement of the dreamers. I was the original co-author uh, of the DREAM Act, again, going back years, and we're still trying to pass that bill. HR 6 is uh, my bill. It is now, we got it out of the House, uh, it's uh, now in, in the Senate. But the reason that that bill finally was able to at least get the momentum and out of the House was not because of just members of Congress, but because of the advocacy of the American people, of folks like uh, Zulema and Norma, who came to Washington and told their stories and put a human face on the yeah. issue. And so everyone has the ability to help to create that positive change by talking to their elected officials, to members of Congress, telling them the, the importance of, of having to pass the HEROES Act, which would provide all kinds of, of protections for uh, a, a, uh, agricultural families and, and their children. So I would say that it is the American people themselves that would create positive change. That's where the power is. That's where the impetus is to get members of Congress and other elected officials to move on this issue and any other issue that is important to our uh, communities. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Norma, would you like to add to anything to that? Yes, I think that as, exactly as the Congresswoman said, there's the people power that's incredibly important and for folks to be able to recognize um, the, the power that they have to be able to change the way things are um, and to be able to dream big. But I think the other big piece of it too is that representation matters. It's, it's really significant and important to be able to have um, a champion on the Hill like the Congresswoman Lucille Robat Allard and other folks that represent us and that look like us and that come from our community and why it was significant when her father also joined Congress. It matters and it's going to be up to us to be able to have a, a Congress that is more representative of our country um, where we all feel like we have a place here. And so I think representation matters. It's important to be able to remind folks to be registered to vote, to vote to fill out the census, to do all of those pieces because they all um, contribute to our representation to make sure that all of us are seen. And I think that's part of today's climate, that when you're seeing these Black Lives Matter movements and the protests erupting in the street is that people want to feel seen and they want to feel heard and they want to see real change. And so back to the question, I, I hope that uh, that teacher can continues to show this film um, and that we continue to support other filmmakers that want to share our stories and that want to be able to fight for our rights and show how important the contributions are by everybody in this country um, and the power that we have to be able to make a change and why representation matters, why we need an HR director that comes from this community, why we need members of Congress that look like us and come from our community, why we need teachers to make sure that they see all of their students and everything that comes with them. 
because that's the only way that we're going to be able to really heal as a country and be able to create a system that works for all of us is to be represented, to be heard, um, and to be able to respect and love one another. And so uh, I think, yes, absolutely building power, um, representation, voting, and taking action to this are, are real ways. Um, and if they are looking for more sort of uh, tangible ways, even going to the farmer's market, I think oftentimes we go and we look for things that are organic and things that are locally sourced, but are we asking how the workers are being treated? Um, that's another question that oftentimes gets left out. Um, and so I think it's important to be able to start asking and questioning that too, um, because the only reason that organic even became a thing was because people started to ask for it. Um, so those are small ways that people can help out in those ways, calling their members of Congress, voting for, for people that represent them. But honestly, those are all small individual choices. This really needs to be a large systemic change. Yeah. The CARE Act needs to get passed. Pathway to citizen needs to be uh, provided, uh, to citizenship needs to be provided. And, and we just need to be able to create a better America. Thank you, Norma. So I'm going to give you the last word here. Yeah. Two, two weeks ago, we watched a very courageous 17-year-old girl uh, probably fight every instinct that she had to turn the camera on and, um, <laughs> and witness George Floyd's murder. Um, and it, 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 it may change the world. I mean, it just was a remarkable thing. And we've seen so many young people uh, pick up that mantle and take to the streets. Um, what role do you see young people playing in, in, uh, in really promoting the rights of migrant farm workers? So um, I definitely agree with all the points made already, um, but I mean, the, the last thing that I could really say is um, people can only do so much before um, when they're, how can I say this? Um, I feel like people need to educate themselves on the matter and educate uh, um, others. Um, I feel like a lot of people, again, go to the grocery store not knowing, not thinking about anything besides their main objective that day. So just just educate education, ed educating themselves on the matter. And I feel like once people do that, they'll be able to sympathize or empathize with um, what we're going through and perhaps, you know, lean, lean in a different way next time that they have to make a conscious decision of, you know, um, buying that through or uh, a teacher pu um, pushing away a migrant student because um, there's been no, numerous times where I've I've been encountered I've encountered situations where my situation was not um, accounted for in a way it was it was just shrugged off I was just a regular student to anybody else or a regular person when that wasn't the fact so you know just people educating themselves I feel like that's the, that's the best start um, to move forward. Well, thank you, thank you, Congresswoman Roy Ballard. Thank you, Norma Flores Lopez. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we, we so appreciate your, your generosity of time and, and all the wisdom you shared with us. Um, we hope you, that you will visit Shine Global's website to learn more about the harvest and, um, and, and, and about um, the circumstances that farm workers continue to, to grapple with. And, um, and I think with that, we'll, we'll sign off and, and uh, turn this back over to Alex. So thank you.